Hello, welcome to Author Hour. I'm your host, Richard Linton, author of North Korea Deception and Hyde Park Deception. Today, I would like to welcome local Philadelphia author Mike Farrer, author of six books, including his latest, The Last Temptation of Mary. We'll talk about that in a moment. His words have jumped from page to stage, with no less than two. Produced off-Broadway plays, he started Love Letter Profiles, a dating profile writing business. His Love Letter Profiles short film has won him awards at film festivals this season, and he's shopping around, as we say in the business, a TV series concept to the streaming services. Mike, welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. And before we begin, I have to say, like, I'm looking at your side profile, and that that. Angled jaw you have is much more pronounced than on the back of your book jacket. Oh, it, I, really? It is. I need to I'm use it. I'm a little it. jealous because I, I don't to have use one at it. all. I need to use <laughs> it. I love it, Mike. There's so much to get into. Normally, we have authors on the show, and 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 you were introduced to me as an author. But you make films. You've done short films. You've done plays. You've written four books. Is that right? Six. And I, I just want to start. By the way, this is so. This is the latest book. I love the cover. Notice the pint of Guinness. With the devil horns coming out and、um, the, the 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 Bloody Mary next to it, and this is basically、uh, you tell us what this is about in a nutshell, just so that. Well, if I could ask you to hold up the other、yep. book cover because、yep. it'll kind of make、yep. sense. So you'll see also a recurring theme about the pint with the devil horns and the devil, you know, the devil tail. And by the way, that was done by a local Philadelphia guy as well. The Last Temptation of Mary. The graphic was done by Paul Prizer,、yep. who is out of Doylestown. Love it. And he did an excellent, excellent、Love、job.、It. So those two books are kind of together with one another. There's the Last Temptation of Mary and the Devilish Pint. And the Last Temptation of Mary attempts to imagine what would it be like if the Mother of God, the Blessed Virgin Mary, comes back to Earth. And she's now out to find love on her own terms because the first time around she married Joseph. It was a, somewhat of an arranged marriage, and she's the queen of love and has never experienced romance and courtship on her own.、Right. So she is followed down to earth by a team of guardian angels, and it's sort of like the queer eye guys. They're they're there to make give her a makeover and watch out for her. And then the devil sees this opportunity that maybe if I can get her. The love of her life. Maybe I can curry favor with the guy upstairs, and we can both break back into heaven. So it's really that kind of a conversation. That's a very modern day story, and you're putting these biblical characters that are so well known universally, and putting them into modern day unique situations. And that's what kind of fascinated me as I was. Teasing the idea for the it's, story, it's very ambitious. I it, feel ambitious because not only trying to be、it. funny. I, I mean, it, it is funny. But I, I, one question I wanted to ask you is, as a, as a comedy writer, which I feel that you are, although you've also written a, no, a that's very accurate.、Story, um, how do you how do you cope with wanting to be funny but making it seem like you're trying not to be funny? Is that hard? Well, that's always the rub, rub right? You wanted to. I, I always thought that humor. Can also make people think. I mean, in this area where free speech is being challenged, there are people like a Dave Chappelle that's going to be funny, yet he's going to have very hard-hitting messages in his comedy routine. So I actually think humor is sort of the last hill that we might all die on in the area of free speech, because you can sneak in a message without clubbing somebody over the head with it, and that. There's always that balance of that. Did I get that right or not? But that's what I find is really fascinating around humor writing, especially in the area of faith, where quite a few of my books have been grounded in faith discussions. I'm a, I was a Roman Catholic. I'm now a Lutheran. I've struggled with, you know, what do I really believe in? What was was I taught versus what I believed in? And rather than go into this heavy, intense. Analysis and bring readers along with it.、Yeah. I can make up these stories that would actually have them think about their own faith and evaluate things on their side and make them laugh. So, to your point, it is ambitious and it's a tall well, order, I but it's something you, that's、I、a lot of fun. You, I think it's fantastic. It's really,、oh, really fun book. Great summer read. Tell us about how you actually physically the writing process, because this is, as I always like to say, a show about writing. So, 
Just give us a little pen picture. How long did it take you to write your four books? How long did it take you to write the plays? And can you just give us a little bit of a sense of your like your writing schedule? Because there's a beautiful. I love the. I'm not going to read it out. I was. I was going to read it out, but it's. It's. We haven't got that much time. So, but I love the way you describe writing in the chapter in the introduction of. No, I think it was another book. Maybe it was this book. But you. You talk about how 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 tough it is to write. You know, however many books. Yeah, like four. Sure. Books. Sure it is. Um, but so so give us a sense. Of you know your schedule, how well, do you get I think it all it's, done. It's an ins- schedule is key, but I also think it's inspiration is overrated. Okay. Right? It's really you know inspiration without action is just entertainment. You just entertain yourself for a moment, like right. gee, I'd love to be an author one day. When in Great fact, point. you really have to take that inspiration and take it to the action to actually write something mm-hmm. down. So I find myself to be more of a you know. Uh, a, a lunch pail writer, like you're an actor, right? There's times when you're not inspired to go on a set, but you're yeah. there because you're being paid to do it, Absolutely. whether you like it or not. Yeah. Yeah. So you want to write whether you like it or not mm-hmm. and write something every day. Wow. So I, I do have an equation that I like to share with people mm-hmm. that I hopefully inspires them. And that is that book that's right over there is is 200 pages or 50,000 words. Okay. If you divide 50,000 words by the number of days in a year, 365, mm-hmm what you get is 136 words a day. So that's actually two meaty paragraphs. Okay. So if you wrote two meaty paragraphs a day and you really stuck to that schedule, mm-hmm. this time next year, you'd be on Richard Linton's show. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> show, great point. Beautiful. Right, because you yeah. would have done it. So it, it really is 15 minutes a day or 30 minutes a day. Do you write seven writing days a week? Day. I, I normally write seven days a week or I really do reserve Sundays as my writing day. Right. So if I don't get it done throughout the week, wow. then I just have some time after church that I just sit down and I have a couple of hours. And I really try to write no less than a thousand words a week when I'm in that writing fever. But sometimes, as you know yourself, you could write a thousand words in an afternoon. So if it's happening there, sure. I'm not going to limit myself. Yeah. But, but, I, but I do think a schedule even if you write, I don't feel like writing right. 50 times, right. yeah, yeah. you know, it's something right. that you can move the ball and, and, and move past all those doubts and fears that everybody else has. And, wh- and wh- where, do you, where do you write and what do you write on? I typically write on my MacBook Air. Mm-hmm. So there's a little promo for Apple. Yep. Um, and I also really can write anywhere. Uh, funnily enough, I love writing in the chaos of an airport uh, lobby in the waiting area Mm -hmm. because your next character might be whizzing by with a suitcase you never know right so i don't really need to have the bubble bath and the candles and the quiet place i can really write anywhere that's great that's great and then and then okay so so say you've written a chapter do you then do you then like how many times will you go over that chapter and then probably not as many (laughs) not as many as you (laughs) should should. (laughs) no because i think you know i might go back into the last few pages to see where i was yeah Almost like a fresh coat of paint, though. I don't yeah. go too far back. Okay. I, I'm a big believer in not editing yourself too much as okay. you're going along. Just get the story out first. Yep. I actually rely heavily on an editor to okay. edit my my stuff yep. and and say, well, this doesn't work. This, you know, an editor is worth their weight in gold, uh, as you know. And I usually try not to edit myself. I'm the storyteller. I'm the writer. I keep to that lane. It's not always easy to do that. Yep. But I also just think moving forward, it's almost like a shark. You know, a shark never looks backward. It's always looking forward yeah. to the next meal and just going to where the story is going to go. Is next. that a professional editor, or is that like a is that like friends that you? Oh, show? I have a professional editor. So, because I notice you got you you give a lot of acknowledgments, so a tons of people have helped you along the way. So, yeah. were those, was that like in the early days when you had people reading your manuscripts, like your early books? Well, in this case. The Last Temptation of Mary, one of the goals was I wanted to write a story about faith, but I always, you know, this is third rail stuff too. You're writing about the Blessed Mother. Right. She is exactly. sacred. Right. Right. So the last thing I want to do is sell books in hell. Right. So what I did in this particular <laughs> case, which I don't normally do, uh-huh. is I actually gave the book to my Lutheran pastor as well as a priest friend of mine wow. to say, you know, I want to go up against a line yeah. but and I want to provoke, but I don't want to be sacrilegious or offend. Now, everybody's, you know, Fantastic. there's going to be people that are going to be offense, yep. offended at the least yep. little thing. But overall, I really wanted to have some guide rails here so that 
I don't lose the reader because I offended her or sure. put, for instance, the Blessed Mother in a compromising position, if you know what right. I mean. Yeah, yeah. I didn't yeah. want to do that. Yeah. I wanted it to be a romantic comedy yep. using somebody that is so sacred and revered. Fantastic. She's the queen of love that has never really had love of her own right. in terms of a romantic courtship. And that's, wanted to stick to that. And, and it was interesting to get those pre-readers opinions because as an example, they both kind of coughed up a hairball as to how I portrayed Joseph. Right. Well, he never really left Mary. He mm -hmm. just sort of died and faded away. Okay. He didn't actually abandon Mary. So that's an example of something that they would have picked up that was scripturally accurate that I had to re-edit. So I was very grateful for their their perspective. So I noticed you your your original website for your books was this you have to tell this me. This is your brain on shamrocks. This rocks. is your brain on shamrocks, all one word. This is your brain on shamrock. Great website. Dot Loved com. it. Dot com. And, but the thing is, that's just for the books. But you, because you're doing so much else, you've now got a new website, mikefarah.com, right? Yes. And, and maybe just a little bit of explanation around yeah. that. So this yeah. is your brain on shamrocks. I love it. It's a fantastic website. Sort of what started it all. Um, I really love my Irish culture and my Irish heritage. I see that. And my first uh, books uh, were actually humorous essays that appeared in the Irish Voice and the IrishCentral.com. Okay. And as an example, you know, when I was growing up, my mother would knock on the door and say, time to go to church. And I'd be like, mom, mass is not going to happen. And my mom would say in her Irish accent, well, I'm sure the Lord Jesus Christ didn't want to get up the day he died for your sins. <laughs> Gee, <I think> so. <laughs> totally, what a totally. Line. Is yeah, that in yeah. your books? It's that, in my books. I, yeah. it be. And then be. my, what a great my line. birds and the bees discussion was one sentence where she said, you know, you didn't get that thing down there between your legs for stirring tea. And that's, is and that, that in, in, in the play? Totally is that, in, I saw, it's, it's isn't totally, that in the play? Exactly, yeah, yeah. I saw that. They got a great laugh. I thought Those are really true. Wait, I just, <laughs> so, so, there's, so if you go to the website, the play, one of your plays, I don't know whether it's a clip Nick or the Brisson, whole play. This is your brain on Shamrock. It's, it's, it's in a theater. In, is mm -hmm. that in Broadway? Black Box Theater. Amazing. Right on uh, Manhattan Repertory Theater. Shout out to them. They're so, doing amazing work. I was going to say, I mean, that, again, just, just switching gears, that is not an easy thing to do. You've got people sitting there in the theater. It was pretty packed. And they're laughing within seconds of your work. That's what I noticed, okay? Because mm. I'm an actor and I, I read, I, I've been in plays that are not funny and supposed to be funny. What was that like for you to have, and how did it come about for you to have your play? So you, I mean, how long did it take to write the play? How did you get it produced off Broadway? Well, the first, a lot of questions there packed in. The first answer would be, how did it feel? Next to the birth of my children, I don't think I've had a better Wow. Experience. I, I can, I'm even getting choked up about yeah, it now. Yeah. Because I was in the back row, and when the place erupted with laughter, I, I'll never forget that moment. I'll, I'll remember what I was wearing. I remember what the theater smelled like. It was just one of those most extraordinary experiences. And I think that's the interesting thing about moving from the book form to the play form. You know, when I just mentioned about my mother and the, did the Irish accent, and I made you laugh. I'm pretty good at that, right? Right. If right. you and I are one on one, are you an actor as well? I, for a hot minute, a little yeah. bit. But if but I not, need to jump okay. in, but it's not, not professional. I'd rather be in the back yeah, row yeah. watching everybody watch it. Right. But one of the things that um, is interesting about comedy writing to me is that if I'd started to bring my mom's Irish accent out, I'd make a whole Irish bar laugh. Right. But one of the things around this is your brain on shamrocks. Is I was always interested in saying, let's say you were in a bar in Nebraska in an Irish bar, and there was the book. And somebody who didn't know me and didn't have the benefit of me talking picked it up with they laugh. Right. right. I was obsessed with that. Right. Like, right. can you make a laugh come out of the written word without the audio, yeah. without the the inflections yeah. and that kind of thing? Yeah, great. Point. And then, you know, that became successful. I was able mm -hmm. to do that. Then it was a matter of, you know, can you write to the rhythm of theater? And can you write to the rhythm of comedy, which includes waiting for somebody to exhale and stop laughing before you throw the next right, line on right. them. And um, one of the first pieces I produced, McLean Avenue, um, it was actually what I learned about it. It was a TV show. It was actually too funny. And what I meant by too funny was the laughs were coming one after another and after another. So people were busy laughing at the last thing you did before they couldn't keep up with the story. They couldn't keep up with the story. Right. So. And one side of the coin, you might think to yourself, well, that's a good problem to have. It's that funny, right? But it, it's not because there is a rhythm to comedy sure. that, that 
I've, I think I've been successful in getting into that rhythm, but there's also been times when I haven't been. And in the case of the, this is your brain on Shamrocks and McBriss's plays, that was really great learning for me uh -huh. to watch a room laugh when they laughed, how to put a beat in right. before you put another funny concept in front of them. And that was like a real, it was a simultaneously, it was a play, but it was almost a laboratory for sure. me as a writer to, to see if I could do that. Was, so the clip that I watched on your Mike, Mike Farah website, mikefarah.com, Mike is that, was that the first night, the theater clip? It was the first or second night. I'd right. actu I actually don't remember. Um, so I guess I'm just curious, like, so so how did you go every night to watch oh, to, of course, to learn yeah. about the laughs? Yeah. I did. And I watched. And, and did it vary each night? It did like vary each say? night. It did vary each night. And right. sometimes the afternoon crowd, um, which might have been a bit older, they actually laughed harder because it brought back memories of their own mother. Oh, and then in the evening, it was more of a, of a diverse crowd and they were younger. Yeah. And so maybe some of the Irish humor might have been too Irish for them, right. so it might have went over their head. Um, but I think, you know, most cultures have a mother that guilts them, <laughs> right? So even though it's, this is your brain on shamrocks, yeah. I could have made it, this is your brain on pasta, or this is your brain on pierogies, because, you know, Polish moms do this, and Italian and Jewish moms do this. My wife's Jewish, so hello. Um, <laughs> so the, we don't, the Irish don't exactly have the, Irish mothers don't have the market cornered on guilt. I guess, yeah, yeah, and that and that is a a, a big thing. Yeah, you 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 talk about the guilt thing, um, and that that brings us on to again something a little bit more serious, which is your it, it's a, is it a thriller, collared? Mm -hmm. It's it's a thriller. It's a fictional um, story about about ca abuse in the in the Catholic priesthood. Let's just take a quick look because as a, as an author myself, I love. This book trailer, and this is what us authors have to do. So just take a look at the collared book trailer. You do know the last five priests that I've written about have been murdered? Yes. You're still willing to do this? I'm not worried. I haven't abused any children. Father Cahill, Father Cuano. Father Keith, we know you and your brother were abused as kids. We'd do anything for each other, right? Yes, Father. So, so what I love about that trailer is, well, first of all, was that your idea to do the trailer? The book company actually approached me and said that this might be some story that would be good for Hollywood. And that was back in 2004. Um, I thought that, the book company thought that, but Hollywood didn't think that at the time because they thought this is 2004, the sex abuse scandal news is just coming out and people thought this was too hot. Right. Now, nine years later, Spotlight gets produced right, and wins insane. Oscars. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what I was <laughs> but thinking. I think, when I, saw I think that. our timing wasn't 100%. And it's funny you should bring up Collard now because that's actually my next project is put that into a script form. I really think that the time is right. Unfortunately, that story of sex abuse in not only the Roman Catholic Church, but in a lot of other positions of power has not gone away and it can still be part of the conversation. I, I find it extraordinary how prevalent both in England and here. It's definitely not just a United States thing, but the whole people who abuse when they were children thing, you know, is just so, I mean, friends in conversation now, I feel, tell me, oh yeah, I was abused. You know, it's just, it's just extraordinary. And I think, I don't know whether, so I don't know what you think, but I don't know whether social media now helps that or, you know, maybe that helps that bring it out more. Um, it, it certainly makes it safer because yeah. people really are much more open to share. Right. Like for me, I wrote that in 2004. Right. And I actually was sexually abused myself. So this is my own way to process what happened to me. So when the book came out, I actually had a drink with the priest that abused me. No way. And I said, I gave him the book and I said, I'm not cool with what you did. I want you to read wow. this. And I want you to have a discussion. And the book ended up leading to a conversation in my high school community in which he was removed and prosecuted. Wow. So, you know, I always tell people whether I never sold one book a collard, that was a triumph for me because Huge. it really allowed me to um, confront and get complete with what had happened to me and take my power back. 
did he did he know what the conversation was going to no, be? No, I hit him right between the eyes. So you you met, and did you say you met in a bar? We met in a bar. I met in a bar. Was he wearing priest? Oh yeah, he was across the street from the school I went to. So so you said let's. What, what, how did you? I did slipped. You, I slipped it over to. Well, first of all, he goes, "Hey, drinks are on me," because I wrote a book, and I went, "So did I," and I wow. slipped this across from him, and I was like. He looked at it because it's a very gothic cover and it's got a, a hand over a, right. a priest's throat. <clears throat> so he, he just looked, he goes, whoa, what's this? And then he read the back jacket and he, he went white and he said, is this about me? And I said, <laughs> it's not about you, but you're all over it. Whoa. So I want you to read this. I'm not cool with what you did. I forgive you. I'm on to you. Wow. And then we're going to have a conversation. So. We had a conversation a few months later. I was going to say, when you said, I'm going to have a conversation, did he like run like, away just then? This, or did you read this and you and I are going to talk. Wow. Wow. So then what happened was he he met me in a bar near my house a couple of months later. And he 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 just said, you know, I, I could see what you meant by I'm all over this. But I never meant that that's what was going on. Um, you know, and then as soon as he did that, he had actually scheduled some nun friends of him, his that live nearby to come in and break up the conversation before I could get into it with him. Whoa. He was very, very one step ahead, which is really something that predatory uh, priests and religious brothers, uh, that's kind of a par for the course. Have you read any of the Boston Globe accounts? They're always one step ahead and trying to control the narrative and control the situation. And he did that. Now he said, oh, this was an isolated incident. But as the, as the book went around the school, um, other people came forward and said he did this, you know, it was a cookie cutter approach that he had. Right. So, um, so it really was an opportunity for me to get complete. Uh, it's a dark book. I, I like to say that if uh, Tony Soprano from the Sopranos was abused as an altar boy and came back to settle some scores, it might look like that. It's a dark, angry book. However, it was a book that I needed to get out of my system so that the lighthearted frivolity of This Is Your Brain on Shamrocks and Last Temptation of Mary can you know, I can put all of that aside and, and have, a, have a dialogue on faith, which many of my books are dialogues on faith and how I was raised, but I want to make them again, as we said in the beginning, very lighthearted. But I couldn't do that with, you know, this like right in front of my eyes, yeah. what had happened, you know. How, how, how prevalent, I mean, like was, it wasn't just you, presumably? It wasn't just me, no. It was, uh, it was other people that came out as well. And so it, did, did this get into like the press? It did get into the press, okay. yes. Yeah. And I mean, the thing is, as a, as a, as a non-Catholic, and, and, and obviously I'm, I, I saw, I watched Spotlight and I'm, I'm sure stuff, you know, has gone on. And by the way, life. when I watched Spotlight, I had to leave the theater twice. Wow. Because I just couldn't. Wow. I couldn't handle it. Wow. It was, that was such a, I can't tell you how accurate that was. Right. Like, especially when the reporter um, is sitting down with her mother and is telling her tomorrow morning, the Boston Globe's coming out. Yeah. And I'm. Right, you're, I've written about your faith right. in a way that you're not going to like. I had the same conversation with my mother, okay. who's a president of the Rosary Society and everything else. I had to have that same conversation with her because she didn't even know I was writing a book. Yeah. So the first copy went to her where I, and my father where I said, this is what happened. And they had no idea. This guy was in our family photos. Right. right. Wow. He had infiltrated so much. So it was starting off there where it wasn't just the family or the kids that were seduced, he seduced the whole family ecosystem, which again is common. And then the second part of the second book went to him where that evening I met him for, for drinks and I was just like this, I'm not cool with what you did sure. and I'm on to you. And did you, at that stage, did you have any idea of what your, did you want him removed? Did you hope that that might lead to him being removed from his job? Well, fortunately, you know, you hear, you hear a lot about the cover-ups, because that's almost right. worse than the crime itself. Right. Um, I will. I will acknowledge the religious order of brothers that uh, they took as soon as they knew they took action and they took appropriate action. Right. So I, I, I felt that it was appropriate once they found out about it. They moved on it with velocity. Right. So um, you know, I'm, so I still donate to my local high school to the high school right. because you know he was one bad apple in a group of of religious brothers and, and religious educators that really enrich my life. So right. I, I, I can take, I can compartmentalize the bad apple and and really appreciate the contributions that that school did for me. Sure. Did And did you, so did you, do you think that 
I mean, was was that the main thing that helped you just get over? Had you been? Yeah, had you, it was the book. Right. So you didn't. You weren't like I going to a psychotherapist. I, for not years at all. That was it. Right. That was that it. was all you needed. You know, I also did. I had also done a personal empowerment course. It's okay. called the Landmark Forum. I did that. Did you really? Yeah, so did I. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. I, I, so I did the Landmark Forum. Right. And did you speak? Did you oh, say? Of course, yeah. Right. But I did the Landmark Forum, and then what ended up happening was. There were two things that were holding me back uh, from writing. The first one is I was ashamed that you'd find out about the fact that I was sexually abused and I was ashamed of that. But then the second one, which is also a, a religious, uh, when I was in the fifth grade, I had a fifth grade nun. When I wrote my memoir, she wrote F and she wrote the word moron. Uh, and uh, from that point forward, uh, I just had it in my head that what? I was inarticulate. Uh. When I was writing emails for business, I would agonize over them because oh. I thought I was stupid and inarticulate. And one of the, you know, this story does have a happy ending because, as you mentioned, Love Letters is a uh, is my short film and it's it's winning at some of the film festivals. One of the most moving nights of my life, apart from the play, yep. was I was at the Brightside Film Festival in Jersey City, and I won Best Writer. Unbelievable. Three miles and forty three years oh. from when I got. The F and the moron. Oh. So it just was such a full circle moment I love it. to go back to Jersey Isn't City and actually claim a Best Writer Award yeah. in a city that taught me that I was stupid and inarticulate. Yeah, yeah. And do you know what I mean? So, um, so in many ways, you know, writing. Um, I, I wouldn't say writing saved my life, but I think writing changed the trajectory. 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 I'll say it for you. We're very articulate people as writers. Trajectory of my life. Because, you know, I could still be sitting in that morass of the abuse. But I literally, when I wrote it, it was bound, it was out of my system, and then I was I didn't look back. Right. And I can talk about it now like I had eggs this morning. Yeah, it's fantastic. I love the way you talk about it because it's so important being able to talk about this kind of stuff. And and and, and again, I, I guess we all have these stories, but it's so funny that moron story because I've told this story before, but I, I remember aged eight, my favorite thing was to was Friday, Wednesday and Friday afternoons in primary school and, and we would write. So I was writing a, a book. I was writing a Cowboys and Indian book. And I'd written every, most kids were writing one or two or three pages and I'd got to page 40 and I was so excited because I'm literally writing kind of a novel. And, and then one afternoon, I'm on chapter like 35 or something and, and Miss Woods, our, our teacher, um, she said, oh, let me see, let me see how it's going today. And, and she sat down and she got a red pen and, she, and I hadn't even finished a chapter. She drew a red line underneath it and put the end. And, and, and she, I mean, I've been looking forward to writing the end like the whole, since I began, right? Anyway, so those stories are just... We all have them though. We all have and, them. And as a writer, getting back to the, the writing process, every writer has some disempowering context. Yes. And it's just a matter of persevering through that yeah that's the difference between people who write and people who don't right you got to you got to keep trying um but another fascinating thing about you gosh we've we've covered some of it <laughs> but the so you now you're now helping people write you, you're using your art your craft your talent to help people write profiles correct me if i'm wrong for matchmaking sites and for business for linkedin for linkedin so to help people with their linkedin so profiles just, just tell and- us about that and, and how do we how profiles. do we how can we use that? So it's loveletters.profiles.com okay. or careerletters.com. Okay. And the diff- there's not a lot of difference. It seems like it's dramatically <laughs> different worlds, but it's <laughs> not because in both cases, inside the writing process, you're instilling people a confidence to go after what they want. Right. So whether or not that's reshaping your resume so that you can really amplify your business accomplishments or you know, getting out of the way, all this lack of confidence or I'm not good enough, yep. making a playful, funny, flirtatious uh, dating profile that really gets somebody's attention. I tell people all the time, I'm going to provide the bait. You're going to provide the hook. You got to wiggle it in the water. Right. But I'm going to provide a funny, flirtatious profile right. for you to kind of, um, you know, be expressed romantically. And then for the for the resume and the LinkedIn, same thing, putting your life story in a context in such a way that brings up all your great accomplishments and and attracts the the jobs and the and the headhunters and things like right. that. So they're kind of similar even though they seem very divergent. That's you got to have the humor again coming back to the humor. It's it's so it's so fascinating. I hadn't hadn't thought about that for the for the match for the match thing. 
Um, it's funny, I, 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 got, I, I had a, a burst tire yesterday and, and there was a policeman behind me stopping the traffic, sort of hit me, I was on, I was in, on Route 30. And I just thought, I was, trying to get, I was trying to get him to crack a smile, the policeman. And I feel like police always have that thing that they, they don't want to get too friendly because that's, you know, they don't want to get too close. That's their thing. Um, but it, it just made me think about humor and how important humor is, you know. Now, I, have um, a, I have a cop that's very good looking in my <laughs> town and, and he's very attractive. And, you know, they'll, uh, I've heard this line from police officers before. If a, if a woman's like, hey, what's your number? They go 911. Oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> I love it. So cops have America. humor too, you know right, what I mean? Right, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> they, they, they do have humor. Um, so um, let me see. Are we, I think we... Uh, almost out of time. Um, oh yeah, so the so the so the so the the, tra- the the trailer for the book collared. Now, sorry, the TV thing. That's where I want to get back to. You're shopping in one minute. <laughs> We've only got one minute left, Mike. Um, but you literally, it's it's th- the the first episode is thirty minutes already. Uh, McLean Avenue. So McLean that right? Avenue. That's Tell that's, that's that. based on my life. Um, being a, a reporter for the Irish Voice and being backstage and watching. Yeah watching the shenanigans that go on backstage and also in the front of the stage with the people that follow these bands. Yeah. And um, it's it's it did great in the film festivals and it's still kind of bouncing around. And then Love Letters Profiles is really sort of like the Amazon modern love mixed with Nip Tuck. It's a little twisted, a little twist in it. And um, so both of those are being shopped around looking for homes and looking for You can for see them on your website. Trailers right? on MikeFarraher.com. Yeah. You can, yeah. Um, but but w- was that just a, a trailer or was that a, a 30-minute episode? Did I miss it? There was it? a 30-minute episode Amazing. and a trailer. Amazing. And then I also did a 12-minute episode for Love Letters Profiles and a two-minute trailer. And being an actor, I wanted to talk all about making that, but then we've run out of time. We've Never run out mind. of time. Never mind. Never Maybe mind. next time. Mike, thank you. You could have to thank come back. Thank you very much. You definitely have to come back. Um, thank you, Mike, for joining us today, uh, taking us from books to plays to screen. You can find out all about Mike and his books at www.mikefaraha.com um, or this is your brain on shamrocks.com. Those are his books. Um, and yes, that is one of the best website addresses you've ever seen. <laughs> but this is your brain on shamrocks. Um, finally, if you've missed it, um, this year is the Queen Elizabeth II's Platinum Jubilee celebration. That means that the Queen has been on the Royal Throne for 70 years. Uh, you can enjoy this non-fiction royal memoir about my great aunt, Aunt Florence Bramford. She traveled the world on royal tours under two Queen Elizabeths, and the book is called From Cottage to Palace, also available uh, available on Amazon. Cheerio, see you next time. Mm-hmm.